About 10 years ago, I was a newly minted priest living in the eastern panhandle of West Virginia. That part of West Virginia was much, much more farm and orchard country than coal country, and the Appalachian Mountains were a good hike west of my town. One Saturday afternoon, I got a hankering to experience some local custom. So I took myself out of my solitary townhouse and headed down to the county fair. And it was fantastic. A perfect window into a particular aspect of Americana, right down to the fried dough, the pig way, and the tractor pull. You ever been to a tractor pull? It's pretty cool. Just with me. As I wandered through one of the tents, a provocative banner caught my eye. It hung above a booth and read, How sure are you of going to heaven? Are you 50%, 75%, 100% sure? Now, I really had no desire to get into a theological sparring match with the man and the woman at the booth, but I couldn't help it. <laughs> I needed to know how someone might arrive at a 75% surety of heaven. I mean, 75%, it's an oddly specific percentage of certainty. I approached the couple, and the woman handed me a tiny pamphlet that looked like a doll's magazine. And the cover sported a yellow happy face, and the words, Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Before I could tell her that I, I had done that, and I preached a sermon about that a few years ago, <laughs> check it out in my archives. Before I could tell her that, something else at their booth caught my eye. It was a wooden box, about this, this size, about that big. It was emblazoned with another provocative question. Do you know the three things God cannot do? My curiosity got the better of me. <laughs> I really needed to know what they thought God could not do, considering God is, you know, God. The fundamental ground of all being, that which nothing greater can be thought, the Alpha and the Omega, the creator of all that is seen and unseen. And I failed miserably at keeping the incredulous tone from my voice. So what are the three things God can't do? <laughs> well, the woman opened the first door. God cannot lie. Okay. She opened the second door. God cannot change. Oh, okay. She opened the third door. God cannot let people into heaven who have not been born again. We talked for 15 minutes. I told them I did not disagree with the first door, but that I preferred to state the sentiment in positive terms. God always tells the truth, or God is trustworthy and faithful. As for the second door, I said that God might not change, but our understandings of God change throughout our lives, and we run the risk of thinking our current view of God is the unchangeable one. This is dangerous because it leads us to remaking God in our own image. At this point, the man asked what I did for a living. <laughs> and I told him I was a priest. He told me I was pretty smart. <laughs> it was not a compliment. <laughs> At that point, I extricated myself from the conversation, which wasn't really a conversation at all, but a theological boxing match. I felt so bad on my way home. How could our understandings of the Christian faith be so divergent? Their intentions were good, 
They wanted to bring people to Christ. But I felt like the impact of their rigid fundamentalism did the opposite. On the other hand, we Episcopalians have a generous and expansive faith that I believe reaches for all of God's possibilities, but we rarely feel comfortable sharing it like the couple at the fair. Indeed, presiding Bishop Michael Curry's sermon at the royal wedding last week caused such a stir precisely because the world heard someone evangelize in an Episcopal manner, and it was awesome. <laughs> and the sticking point here is this. The rigidity of fundamentalism makes it easier to proclaim than the expansiveness of generous faith. It's much easier to market something as certain than to share a faith built on wonder and practice. And yet that is exactly what God calls us to do, and that's what Jesus does in today's gospel lesson. Each of the doors in the booth's What God Cannot Do box contains scripture citations, and the third door pointed to the gospel lesson that I just read, John 3. The, that third door said, God cannot let people into heaven who have not been born again. The county fair proselytizers took this from something Jesus says to the Pharisee Nicodemus. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. It seems pretty clear at first blush, seems like door number three was accurate after all. But a second look reveals an entirely different reading of those same words. And if you were listening to when I read the gospel, I didn't actually say them, did I? Some English translations do read, born again. Others, like the one I read, read, born from above. The Greek word could mean either. And I think Jesus speaks it specifically because that word contains inherent ambiguity. You see, he's trying to break Nicodemus out of his rigidity. That same type of rigidity that leads to banners asking how sure you are of getting into heaven. And a few verses later, Jesus speaks another intentionally ambiguous word that could mean either wind or spirit. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. The spirit blows where it chooses. With these ambiguous words, born again, born from above, wind, spirit, with these ambiguous words, Jesus breaks Nicodemus out of his rigidity and leads him to an expansive faith based in wonder. We know this because the Pharisee asks at the end of their discussion, how can these things be? This question starts Nicodemus on a journey, which ultimately leads him to the foot of Jesus' cross. If Jesus had not broken Nicodemus out of his rigid understanding of God, Nicodemus would not have made such a journey. For where he went from the cross and the tomb, we do not know. But I like to imagine him sharing the story of his midnight conversation with Jesus so others might embrace the expansive, generous faith that Jesus offered him. It might be easier to create sound bites for rigid fundamentalism, but the easy way is often not the best way. The world is full of people who have questions and doubts and fears. The world is full of people with unspoken existential dread that they do not have the tools to face. The world is full of people yearning for something some connection to something greater than they are. People of faith and people of no faith 
responded to Bishop Curry's sermon at the royal wedding because he spoke the truth with passion and generosity, and it stirred the ember of faith smoldering inside each person who heard him. Our faith might not fit onto a bumper sticker or within a doll's magazine, but that can't stop us from sharing our faith. That generous, expansive faith that Jesus shared with Nicodemus. This faith, which we share, opens us up instead of shutting others down. This faith we share embraces new possibilities instead of clinging to the narrowest of old dogmas. This faith we share enlivens us to be about the mission of God a mission of healing and reconciliation in a world full of brokenness. So share it, we will, with God's help.